So here's a, an example of back corrosion. You can see it's a terminal, um, open-ended terminal, right? No heat shrink. And over time, the wire simply literally disintegrated and disconnected itself. Now, you know, if it's a small appliance, like, I don't know, like a light, it's just a nuisance, right? Well, it depends what type of light, right? If it's just a light in your cabin, no big deal. But if it's a nav light, that could be pretty serious. If it's a bilge pump, that's pretty damn serious. So again, you know, if you have something, you always want to be able to depend on it. And nothing drives us more crazy generally than intermittent problems or things that stop working randomly, right? So that would be something why you should think about insulation and making sure that over time, corrosion doesn't eat the wire away. So what's the formula for success if you're going to actually do crimps on board? Uh, the first thing is you've got to choose proper marine wiring. Uh, on boats, some owners, especially more legacy boats, uh, the worst case would be solid wire. That's, and you can find that on older boats that had AC systems added onto them. So where that's where you have a solid strand wire, right? Like literally house wiring. And you've got that from boats from the 70s and 80s where originally they didn't have AC on board and some house electrician came on board and just simply recreated what would happen in a house on a boat. And so you're gonna have solid core uh, AC wiring. If you have that on board, and that's generally a do-it-yourself, you really have to be concerned because over time, especially with boats, because of vibration, uh, there is there is definitely a possibility where that wire is actually going to like, shear off, right, between one another, and then you're going to have this kind of on-off, on-off, on-off connection coming on, and that could be a cause for fire. The other thing, too, that you've got, oh, before I forget, on, on marine wiring, you also want to make sure that you have fine, so it's multi-strand, right? And it's tinned. Now, a lot of boats, even recently built boats, uh, are using, especially in the larger cabling, they're using non-tinned cabling. And you'll, some people call it, well, you see it, it's actually, it comes for the application of welding wire, really stiff wire. Um, the jacket is actually, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, the jacket might not be appropriate, so something to think about. Well, I'm gonna go through them one by one a little bit later on anyway, so I don't wanna to spend too much time. You've got, you wanna make sure you choose the right terminals, right? So the right terminals, if you've got a really shitty terminal, and the terminal is like five cents, and it looks terrible, and it just, you just feel it, no matter what you do to that terminal and how you do the connection, it's just not gonna give you the right thing, right? And you always want to, what I always recommend to other owners, and I certainly do aboard my own boat, is when I think about my time invested in doing something on my boat and all the things I have to do constantly, and the list is always adding, I always tell myself, do I want to redo that in five or 10 years? Do I want to recome and redo this crimp and take a shortcut now so that I actually have to come and redo that crimp five to 10 years from now? And for me, the answer is no, because I still always have more stuff looking ahead and so when I do something, I don't want to always have to look behind and worry about something that in relatively short term just happened five or 10 years ago. I don't mind revisiting something much later on, but you want to give yourself enough horizon so that you don't have to constantly redo something that you just recently did. We'll talk about a little bit about adhesive line tubing. So that's kind of heat shrink, right? And how you prevent uh, corrosion from happening at the joint between a uh, terminal and a wire the right tools for the job, and then the right technique for the job, okay? So this would be a picture of, you know, a little bit some maybe bad connection, right? Uh, this is a bonding system on one boat on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, that's a client that decided to expand a terminal strip by um, putting a bunch of terminals to a nut, putting electrical tape in between and didn't even bother actually heat shrinking the terminals. And they're about a buck or two each. So he bought, non, he bought heat shrink terminals, but never applied heat to actually make them you know, corrosion proof. So again, I actually see that quite often. A lot of uh, do-it-yourselfers or even so-called pros are gonna be using the right gear, but they're not actually gonna be using the right technique to actually make use of the proper terminal. All right, so if you're choosing marine wiring, what are the things you should look at and why, why does it matter? It matters because, first of all, with marine uh, wiring, you can actually have, you can have different colors to mean different things. And sure, everyone could drive on 
the right or the left side of the road. You could drive home in reverse if you wanted to. You could drive in reverse on the right side of the road if you felt like it, and all that road would still lead you back home. And that's the philosophy that some people have is like, well, a wire is a wire, really. What does the jacket mean? It's what I intend to do with the wire that matters, and I'm going to wire my whole boat in black. And that works. It does work. It really does. But the problem with that is you need to know what each wire does. And if it ever becomes disconnected or someone else comes and has a look at it, the, if they ever get them reversed and they don't get it reversed under no load, so no voltage, they do the connection, they turn a switch on, and then suddenly you know, they don't have the ability of disconnecting or they're not there to see what's happening, your boat's going to there's a high probability, you're going to have serious damage. The wire is going to melt. The installation of the jacket is going to melt. It's going to be a dead short, right? And that would be really serious. So that's why the standardization of colors is really good. Different colors for different meanings. And if you buy marine grade wiring, you can easily get that. Um, the other thing too is what I was talking about, multi-strand. So when you think about welding cable, it's pretty rigid. But if you take fine multi-strand cabling, you'll see it's really malleable. You can really and so on a boat, when the engine is running, you've got a lot of vibration, and so, or at seas. So that's the advantage of having marine wiring. Also, it's flexible for install. The big thing, too, that most people uh, is underappreciated is that welding wire, for example, the jacket of a welding wire is actually not oil proof. Um, and that's actually, I was on a boat three years ago where, um, the boat had nice welding wire properly laid up against the bulkhead cabin, really nice, all held in place. And above that, there was Raycar fuel filters. And one of the Raycar fuel filters leaked. Happens, right? I mean, they do leak sometimes. The leak landed on the welding cable. And the welding cable where the leak landed, the jacket melted off. So he had two wires running side by side. Luckily, they were well supported because both wires were completely bare, no more jacket on the wire, and they were positive negative going to an engine, i.e. unfused. So if they would have ever touched, the boat would be gone. I mean, there's no, it'd be like a fire wire. And so when you have welding wire on board, make sure that it will never be exposed to any type of oils or fuel, okay? And then obviously because the wire is tinned, it's, it's better at inhibiting corrosion than uh, welding wire, uh, which is simply bare copper. All right, this is another example of someone not being able to fit you know, a large gauge wire into a terminal, right? So they've got a, a gauge 10, 20, or 10, 12 connector on a 20 amp breaker, and that cable is probably, probably looks like a gauge eight. And so what they did is they fit whatever strands they could fit. And you can notice that cable or wire is actually solid strand. Pretty much, not solid, but it's not certainly marine. You can see the strands are way too big. And so they just fit what they can. And this is how I found it on one of the boats. So that would be unacceptable, absolutely, especially under load. All right, so when it comes to choosing the right terminal for doing an electrical job, you want to choose the right right type of con terminal for the job, right? Like, you know, are you going to be using a ring connector? Is it a spade? Is it a butt connector? Is it a disconnect? And the other thing you want to do is you actually want to have the right size, right? Especially for ring or even for spade and fork uh, for the right screw type, right? Because there's going to be different sizes. So you don't want to have a gauge, you know, number 10 if the faster that you're going to be using is, uh, or a 5 16th ring on a number 10 screw. And I see that all the time. So they'll put the screw in and they'll cinch it down and they'll get just a little bit top edge and that's gonna be sufficient. Yes, it works. I'm not saying it doesn't work under load, but it's not right and it could be a problem point, okay? The other thing you've gotta ask yourself is what type of terminals am I gonna use? Am I gonna use heat shrink terminals or am I gonna use nylon terminals, right? Nylon terminals obviously offer, come at a better price point, but they don't offer there's no installation for heat shrink, so you can't make it a completely sealed connector. So that's a trade-off. And as a boat owner, you've got to decide, you know, am I wanting to risk corrosion on this connection over time, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now, 
and that's, or do you simply do heat shrink and pretty much forget about it? So those are the different types of terminals you can choose. These are pictures of what happens on loose connections. That's a loose fork connection on a neutral bus on the right. And on the left-hand side, that's a Weimar electrical outlet where the connections are simply plugged in and it was a loose connection on the neutral. So, all right. What about uh, a D, like heat shrink? Um, well, the reason why you do it is to offset corrosion. Normally, I would suggest that you buy, you know, uh, if you're going to do probably yellow and red would be better than yellow and, or black and red. Black in AC means death, and in DC it means benign. So ABYC has been shifting to not use black on DC for that reason, because it's pretty obvious when you see black too odd that it's probably not AC wiring. But if you've got a number 8 gauge or a number 6 gauge or a number 10 gauge, is it a DC wire or is it an AC wire? It could really be both. And then it's context that makes you figure out what it is. But really one would kill you and the other one is like touching your engine, right? So th they're so completely different in terms of their consequences that ABYC has been shifting to yellow for a DC. So I encourage you, if you're buying heat shrink and you want to color code your terminals, make sure you put yellow on the DC grounds, right, the DC connections, and then put positive as red. Um, you want to use heat to properly shrink down the insulation. Like I was saying, not everyone knows that even if you buy a um, heat shrink connector, the properties of pro prohibiting or preventing corrosion are only delivered if you actually shrink down the heat shrink itself with a heat gun. Uh, it might be uh, a little butane torch with skill, right? Because it could burn. You got to know what you're doing. Uh, but a heat gun is good. Takes slower. Heat torch is faster, but you could have a you got to have a right distance, right? So that you don't char the terminal or the wiring. And then also, what knowing what the shrink ratio is, right? Because not all your shrink are the same. Some are dual walled, some aren't. Um, and the other advantage too with heat shrink is it actually is another really good connection point. So it added further makes it harder for that connection to get undone. These are examples of what happens on a bad crimp. So the terminals themselves were really good on the circuit breakers. They weren't loose or anything. And you can see the wire actually melted off. Like it's, some of the wires actually were gone. Like the, it's so much current going through it, so much heat, that the wire actually melts off. So again, depending on the make of your boat and how everything is close by, that heat, when it's generated, can be pretty problematic. And that's what happens with AC shore power receptacles. You know, generally where they are, they're surrounded in a fiberglass, right? Because it's a metal enclosure, but everywhere where that normally is mounted is wood or fiberglass. And as that connection gets really hot, it actually ignites the fiberglass around it. And then the boat just keeps going. All right. So I brought different tools. And we've got different tools. Um, I'm not sure if we're doing it on this table or probably this table over here. Uh, different tools that are the right types of tools for the job. Um, I would say that the first thing that you're probably going to want is to get what's called a wire stripper of some sort. There's different tools. You can see I've got, I brought another one here. There's different models, right? Everyone's going to have something that feels right for them. Romeo has a certain way of doing it. There's not a one size fits all uh, solution for wire strippers. Um, I like this one. The other one here on the left is pretty popular. Some people like the, the one on the right. It's really up to you. What's important, and we'll talk about the technique, is making sure the end result is right. You don't want to cut any strands, right? You don't want to lose. And it's not acceptable that you say, oh, well, most of them are there. It's fine. You just don't want to lose. If you're taking a jacket, insulation jacket off a wire, and you're seeing a lot of strands come out of your hand, you should probably redo the end, cut it off again, and start over to make sure that that wire is completely integral when you're doing, uh, in doing the terminal. Looking at crimpers, there's, a, again, a wide selection. Um, I'm showing two examples. I have one here. 
uh, which uh, Western Marine um, lend us a bunch. We have two or three of them here. Um, and this is actually probably the easiest and safest, no-brainer way of doing a crimp. So if you're thinking of tackling an electrical project on your boat, I mean, this is not as cheap as some of the tools out there, but this ratcheting crimp is always going to make sure that for every single size of terminal, you're going to have the right pressure on that, on that terminal. And on the bigger jobs, like you know the ones that have to, have to go through code and whatnot, uh, which is not at the smaller boat market, but like real boats, um, you actually have to use this tool. You can't do it any other way. Because this guarantees the right crimp every time. The other ones are really something that happens over time through experience. So uh, I would say if you're not an expert at crimping, this is probably one way to offset lack of experience would be using a tool like that. This is uh, from Anchor. I've got, at the end, you can come and see where we're going to be doing the demos, and Romeo is going to be doing some of the wire crimping. Um, you can see I've got a bunch of these uh, crimpers, so you can have a look at that, okay? Anchor is not the only one that does it, but we like it. Um, we use it. The, the idea is you basically want to have a ratcheting crimper, okay? Yeah? Pardon? Welding rod? A welding wire. A welding wire is a, is a sort of wire that you'll find on most boats. And it's a wire that is built specifically for welders in mind. Welders use electrical wire to actually weld. And it's to deliver power when they're actually welding. And the one thing that's maybe for not really uh, considered, oh yeah, here's that. Yeah, there's an example of welding wire. And actually, this is the one that you can come have a look. This is the one where the client actually put uh, rescue tape. This is the wire that melted off from diesel fuel. I kept it because it's just so unbelievable. Um, and what you got to remember is when a welder buys a cable for welding, he never thinks, he's not investing. You know, he's saying to his honey, I bought the cables. They're going to be good for 20 years. I'm so happy. I invested in them. I'll never have to buy another pair of welding cables again. You know, they buy the cable, after a year, they're gonna buy another cable. But on a boat, whatever you put on a boat, you're not changing your wiring every, tw every year. You're changing it maybe never. It might be there for 30, 40, 50 years, right? Boats aren't discarded after five years or 10 years. They've got a long history, right, a long life. So the problem is when you take a shortcut and you use welding wire, and the reason you do that is because the cost is so good, um, the builders are going to use them because they're trying to save pennies. That's what it is. And that's fine. But if you have that, you have to know its limitations. So if you've got welding wire and you can see it's untinned, right? Um, so it means that it's, gonna, it's copper. It's going to oxide. And then when it's oxide, it's going to provide more resistance. You want to make sure that you take all the other extra steps to make sure that that wire is not going to see any water, limit the moisture that it sees, close ended connectors, all these different things so that you don't have corrosion, okay? So the technique that Romeo is gonna do when uh, looking at doing uh, terminals is, you, first of all, you gotta make a decision for you. What's your budget and what are, what's the application you're doing? Are you gonna go with a nylon terminal or a heat shrink terminal? In our business, we use heat shrink everything. For me, and it's a question, it's, it's a question that every one of us has to answer, it's not worth for me doing a connection that in five, 10, or 15, or 20 years, is going to come apart. For me, whatever step I do forward, I want to make sure that I don't go back. But that's my choice. Okay, so all of us have to make that decision for ourselves. The other thing that's really important, and you see that a lot, and this is a common mistake, the worst is actually to take too little of the jacket insulation. So you put the wire into the terminal, and you're actually crimping on the insulation, not on the wire itself, on the metal. So you can have a really bad crimp or a partial crimp because realistically the metal the metal connection that's supposed to happen is actually going to have part of the insulation in there. And so that could be really hazardous. So that's one thing. And the other thing too is having too, too little, like you're removing too much of the jacket. And that happens as well. And then what you're doing is, depending on the type of crimp, you're supposed to have some part of the jacket because another part is going to go and actually crimp onto that. 
right? So you don't want to have too little or too much. You have to have the right amount. It's easy if you do it too much. You cut the wire, start over, and do it again, right? And over time, you'll get a sense of what is the right amount to remove. So you make sure it, you never, you make sure as you put it in that you don't actually, that you always see the seam, right? Because otherwise you're wondering, did the jacket actually go into the sleeve of the terminal? Okay, that's really important. Make sure, you know, what I do is I actually, I, I turn a little bit of the strands to make sure that all the strands are actually going to go into the terminal. You see that too, some people put the strands and the strands start flaring out. Now, it's fine for a terminal that's in the air by itself, nothing else, but in a lot of applications, you're going to have terminal to terminal to terminal. And if you've got a positive touching another positive, and one circuit breaker is off and the other one's on, then the current's going to go through one wire to the other wire back down. So you want to make sure that there's no loose strands coming out of a terminal. You want to crimp the right amount. You're thinking, well, how do I know that? If you've got a ratchet and crimper, you won't have to figure that out. If you don't, then what's going to happen is you want to be able to crimp the wire hard enough that you don't obviously break the installation. Right? That's obvious. And also what you're going to do is what's called, and that's the ultimate thing that you should always do, is do a pull test. And honestly, on a gauge, I don't know what it is, but on a gauge 10 wire or 12, you can pull as pretty much as hard as you can, and that terminal can't come off. So don't be scared of saying, well, I don't want to break it. It's actually counterintuitive, but if you can actually pull it off, that means you don't have a good crimp. And if you don't have a good crimp under load, i.e. when the current is running through it at maximum capacity, potentially you could have resistance, which causes heat, which causes more resistance, and it snowballs. And then the last thing, depending on what type of uh, terminal you've used, you can apply heat shrink. So if you bought, if you decide to go with heat shrink, then what you would do is you'd apply the heat shrink on the terminal, on the installation, and then it would shrink down. And you want to see it literally evenly done, and you want to see it ooze at the bottom. There's going to be a little bit of a gel that's going to come out. And then once that's done and it's cold, again, you do a pull test, because you've got to wait till it's cold, because otherwise it's going to distort, and then you're done with the terminal. If you do it properly, and I see it on boats that are really well built. You'll never, I mean, honestly, it's, it's, it's generation. Like 30, 40 years, 50 years. I mean, some boats that I see, they're really, really well done, like Hatteras. You know, they're built in the 70s. And they've been to everywhere, not just in our waters, where it's, the salinity is not that high, but like literally everywhere. Um, the terminals are out there. They were taken, done with care. They're still going to be good. And then you've got other guys that are doing stuff and taking, cutting corners and just and then maybe after 5, 10 years or 15 years, depending on what happens on the boat, um, especially if there's a lot more moisture, then those connectors could literally fall off. Okay? So that's kind of like the reason for why it matters and what you should do. So the next thing we're going to do is uh, I'm going to bring you to the table uh, if you want to see. And I'm going to have Romeo show you how to do crimps. And there's a bunch of other crimpers there and people can ask questions. Yeah, there's a question? Yeah. How do you, like, are they, I know uh, with marine wire, when I've read it, that it's some marine and some wire. Now, on the battery cables, like, how do I know if it's just not on a boat of the battery cable? Well, you know, the good thing is that, okay, so the question is, how do I know if it's automotive cabling or marine wire? Well, first of all, um, you could generally get a sense just by the feel of the wire. If the wire feels stiff, it's not marine. Okay. At the end of the day, marine wire is very flexible. That would be one day, one way. Um, there's also a UL code that you, I don't know offhand. There's a UL code that's going to say there's not that many manufacturers of marine wiring, right? There's Ancor. Um, there's uh, a what's the other one? Alamo. And I can't. There's a few other companies, but not that much. And they're actually going to brag about it. Like nobody's going to be building a marine cable and go incognito. Okay. Like it's like, uh, it's like having, if you have a, uh, a smart charger, nobody's not going to put smart on the device if it's a smart charger. They'll just call it a charger, right? If they're not anything else than that. But nobody in marketing is ever not going to take, you know, brag about something to differentiate. Because at the end of the day, when you look at the cabling, the price difference is significant, okay? Multiples of. It's not like welding cable is like a dollar a foot and, you know, uh, marine wiring is $1.10. It's not a 10% increase. It could be literally multiples of. So if it's, 
if the jacket looks crispy too, like over time, marine welding wire, especially in a marine environment, you'll see actually the insulation of the jacket is actually going to crack. It's almost going to be like dry skin. And you're going to actually see, I've seen some boats where they literally are peeling off, like almost like oranges. Like they're actually cracking off because it's been 20, 30 years, right? And over time, that welding wire was not meant to be used for 30 years in a marine environment. It was used to be used by a welder for a year, throw it away, buy a new set of cables. So that might be the way that, how you would know. Um, there is actually, when you look at Ethernet wiring, so that's probably what you're talking about communication. Um, yes, there are different types of Ethernet wires out there. And there's definitely, uh, there's actually even connectors that are for marine. You can't find that anywhere. Like, you've got to go online. Um, but absolutely, there are, there are definitely Ethernet connectors, uh, RJ45, that are meant for marine applications. And you'll find them, for example, we work on some bigger yachts, like 100 foot or plus, and a lot of them will have a lot of IP-based communications on those boats. Um, and on that, you're going to be using different, not just your standard Ethernet cable that you're going to have in a home land environment, and there's spec for that as well. You pay more for it, obviously, but again, probably better. A lot of those cables generally are mission critical type of applications on the larger yachts. And so you can't, it's not a convenience thing. They absolutely need that cable to be integral for the duration, foreseeable duration of the service. Any other questions? All right, without much ado then, I'm gonna bring you to the table so that you guys can see uh, the crimps uh, being done by Romeo. And I'll be able to answer any questions there. So the problem is when you're, a, you're yourself a do-it-yourselfer, and you've, what's your limit? How many crimps are you gonna do in a year? It's harder, right? And it's not, exactly, so they do it. So what's really good to offset that lack of experience that Romeo has, right? He can do it in his sleep. He probably be in coma, he'd be able to do crimps. But where you wanna do is something like that, it's always gonna bring the right one. And remember what I was saying at the beginning, what's interesting is that you don't have room for error, right? It's not getting 99, like honey, I did amazing. I got 99.9 .9 right. It's the one that you got wrong that is one too many. So that's why this makes more sense. But when you do that, that's like a wide open door. So what you're really protecting is it's almost for, really it's of no use. Putting heat shrink on the side here, when the tongue is open, it's of no benefit. And especially on the larger lugs, right? The larger lugs are like, you know, maybe about this big. And you put a heat shrink on the seam and you've got all the wires open. And you're thinking, well, moisture's not gonna go up. What happens is over time, as the wire is being used, it heats up. Right. Guess what happens when it heats up and it cools down? Moisture gets wicked in and out. And that moisture on an untinned connector, like I go on boats, boats that have been in service for 20, 30 years, you start cutting the wire. Okay, we got a bad connection. Two inches, four inches, six, eight, a foot, a foot and a half. I've gone up two feet deep until you get bare copper. All of that is completely oxidized. And now do you replace the whole wire? Well, then at one point, the problem is, well, the problem is, well, that's the thing too, is that at one point is how long is the wire run, right? A lot of them, at that point, it's too short. And if you're going to service, you should bring to a terminal strip. You should not put a butt connector. And then you got to put somewhere, put another wire. But then it's another weak point. If it's a starter circuit, you're not going to do that. You shouldn't have Because every, every, splice every connection is, is a potential is failure. Yeah, yeah. So that's what I'm saying is like I had a client that had a relatively new boat. And he had made in China open-ended lugs, copper, copper untin wire, welding wire with just heat shrink on the side. And I told the owner, I said, if I were you one weekend, what you should do is cut every single one of those lugs. You're gonna lose this much now. You can still service all of it. But in five or 10 years, if this is a long play for you, when the, the jacket is gonna be, the, the corrosion is gonna be six inches deep, you won't have enough. And then it's too late. So now is your opportunity to fix it before it gets bad. You said and, a terminal connector, what do you mean by that? Well, because they normally, like those, with yeah, that's right. Yeah, or they, they'll they'll do like, uh, for example, they, they do that on uh, outboards. For example, um, they'll have this stud. And it's going to be a double. It's not a switch. It's like you've got one terminal from the engine, right, from the outboard, and then the other one going to the battery, right? So because normally a lot of the cables that come on a Yamaha or Honda aren't that good quality wiring. They're not, right? And so what you do is as soon as it comes into the boat, you bring it to this bus bar. 
Yeah. Right? It's like a, and it's got, it's going to literally have multiple studs, pairs, and some of the wires you terminate, and then the other ones go out. And it's also a good place to troubleshoot, right? That's like, okay, I got power right to almost the outboard. I see it there. If I don't see it there, you know it's coming in pretty much in the outboard. So can you make that uh, as good as this with heat shrink if you, no. if you bring it up? No, because you won't. It's never going to be the same. It won't be the same. That's what I'm saying. Is like If I put this, I don't bother putting heat shrink. If I'm going to use heat shrink, then I'm going to use this type of okay, terminal. So, so this is already extended over yeah. properly shaped. Yeah, look, exactly. Like that. That's it. That's done. Is that telling what do you call those nylon ones? Uh, no, those are heat shrink terminals. Oh, yeah. heat shrink terminals. Okay. Yeah. And you can get them, in, and I mean, literally, the price is huge between the two. A dollar each. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, this is free, effectively, almost. You can buy them. It's not five cents. I don't I mean, it's insignificant. This, if you're going to choose, well, on my boat, I do it all with this. But as an owner, you, if you're in the bills, you should do this. If it's a life critical application, nav lights, right? A nav light is up in the bow. You know, you're going to see water there. You know, you should heat shrink. If you're going to do an anchor light, do this, right? Because you're in the hassle of going up, it's going to take forever. All those things that are not serviceable, you should be targeting having these. Then you might say, well, I'm only putting, I don't know, my downrigger in for five years, and I, maybe you start taking shortcuts and be using these ones. I like these ones, but I mean, at the end of the day, everyone has a budget, right? So, so it depends. It comes like this. Yeah, all like that. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. And then the heat shrink closes in. Correct. The, the, the too much wire was. That's right. There, right. That's yeah, exactly. Way too and much. It should be just butted. Correct. The, that's right. And so, should there be? Should you crimp on the insulation at all? No, not on these not ones. Crimping. Not on this oh, type. Okay. This one here is a double crimp. Um, when you put it in, depending on the. The, these ratchet crimpers have double crimps. Oh. They'll do one on here and one on. And a lighter one on yeah, the insulation. Yeah, that's right. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what I was saying earlier was you really got to make sure that, and I've seen that, and this is the worst, is you cut too little insulation, and then you actually have the insulation going in underneath, and that's the worst, right? So you always have to be able to see. It's like a fine line. You have to see a fine line. You have to see the insul the jacket and see this. You've got to barely see the metal and then the metal starts of the wire. If you don't see it, it, ha it, ha it it's underneath. And the question is how far underneath is it? So don't say, well, I, it's not too much, I don't think, right? Because also when you crimp down, now you, the, a part of that terminal won't be able to touch the wire. So you basically, you should see it sticking out. Well, you want the wire to reach, yeah, and that's the other thing too. Like on these ones, it's harder because but on this one, you want to be able to see. To the end of that metal Correct. The see that's it. right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, it'll make it real so you want to just and you know if you're going to do it in priority, think about what are things that are life critical on your boat. Like if you're going to if you're dependent on your GPS, that'd be a good one to start doing. Your anchor light, it's pretty important. Nav light, pretty important. Bilge pumps, utterly important. And those are the ones that if you're going to spend time on doing them properly. You know, take these connections and take just do it slow because once you've done it, you'll never have to do it again, right? So you don't want to just hammer them out like you've got a gun to your head. Some right. of them have glue in there too. Yeah, that is actually that is glue in there. It is part of it. Like you see, this actually you can actually see the glue coming out. You see that at the end. Um, so this actually has glue in it right now. It's only it only comes out when you apply the heat and it's going to ooze out. Yeah, and on the large, like, yeah, exactly. And you can see that on the larger. You can even see it on the larger terminals. Like this is uh, only a gauge 14, 16, but on the 12, 12 10s, or there's even eights for heat shrink like this. You'll see a lot of ooze coming out. And you want to when you're using a heat gun, you want to make sure that you evenly apply the heat, right? So that you don't see any air pockets anywhere because an air pocket. From one air pocket to another air pocket to another pair is now effectively it becomes a, effectively a pathway for moisture to go in. I, you can't do it all. You can't. It's just you can't redo everything. I mean, it, nobody has the time. It would take thousands of hours if we were on a small boat. So what you do is you just target the ones that you think, okay, which ones are the ones I, I matters the most to me? Or for example, some boats. Let's say for example, if you have a small a power boat. The engine room on a small power boat can have pretty humid, pretty nasty place when you think about it, right? Like closed hatch, yeah, the blowers come on, but they only come out some amount of time. There's always water in the bilge, right? That place is horrible for corrosion. Like it's horrible. 
So if you've got terminal strips in there or anything in there that are going forward, feeding forward, you want to redo all those connections because the, the humidity level is it, through the roof, right? And especially in the winter, it's not that bad because the air is not able to suck the moisture and at least the moisture is on the ground. But as you, in the summer, when it's warm, the air can hold a lot more moisture. So the moisture that's in the village now is in the air everywhere, right? And it can it's touching everything. So you really want to make sure that those areas that are high moisture environments, if you have any types of these terminals in there, that would be the ones I would target. The ones in your boat, in your cabin, they'll never get su super humid, right? Because they're out in the environment, you know, they're equalizing with the... T it's not that bad, but the ones in the engine rooms are the worst. What's a good way of... Uh, Those little boats I'm talking about, not the big trawlers, right? What's a good way of protecting a, a bus bar connection where the eye goes over the stud? Yeah, I don't... Um, there's people that put Lanacote. There's different sprays that exist to cover connections. Uh, yeah, Lanacoat. Um, there's all these different products. I find that I don't like them because it attracts a lot of dirt. Um, but in the Caribbean, in Florida, and the eastern seaboard, where there's a high, much higher level of salinity than in the Pacific, um, it's strongly encouraged. Here in BC, the salinity level in our local waters is very low. It is. It's just the water here doesn't... I mean, if you swim here and you swim in the Caribbean, You'll cry in the Caribbean. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, 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 like your eyes are burning. Wow. Here, you won't cry. So the saline level is different. Hawaii's bad, too. Yeah, like, so the rigging in Hawaii only lasts, like, 10 years. You have to change it. Yeah, you have to change it. It's gone. But in BC, it's not the same. So I guess for here, I don't think it's necessary. I've got a lot of my clients that have boats from the 70s and 80s that were well built, like a lot of clients with Hatteras or whatnot. And the boats are local, and the connections have never had it. No problem. But if your boat's leaving offshore and you're going to go in, in those places, then you might want to think about using those types of sprays. And then it's an offset between cleanliness, right, um, and uh, corrosion prevention. Practical Sailor made a big article about it. They use Lanico, they put it out outside, they sealed the box, they had the connections out there, and they had terminal strips literally with some, without, and they left it there for a year. So it was an accelerated type of, you know, marine environment. You know, it was like salt water in there. It was like horrible environment. And obviously the ones that were protected did better. They just do. I just think it might be an overkill in our waters here. I think this is probably the best way. And then it's just more manageable. I've got one bus fire.